Welcome. Just before we start, just the usual housekeeping. Those with mobile phones, which is everyone these days, if you don't mind just turning it to silent or turning it off for the duration of the service, please. As I said, welcome. My name is Brian Walsh, and on behalf of the family of Mrs Aileen Isabel Ravity, or just Aileen, as most of you affectionately knew her, I thank you all for coming to this service today. The service is to commemorate Aileen's life and acknowledge her impact and influence on ourselves and the community in general. Aileen passed away in Harmony Village, Shepparton on Thursday, April 6th, and will be sadly missed by all who knew her. We are gathered here today to remember Aileen, to give thanks for her life, to reflect on all she was to us, to acknowledge our own grief at losing her, and for the purpose of extending our deepest sympathy to all who mourn her death. Especially her husband Keith, her daughters Margot and Kristen, her son-in-law Graham, her sons-in-law Graham and Dean, to her grandchildren Sean, Nathaniel, Edward, Patrick, Sarah and Elliot, and to all of you here who have lost a relative or a friend. Today, I hope you enjoy spending time remembering the happiness you shared with Aileen. Aileen passed away after losing a long struggle with age and illness. And even though we were expecting that she would pass away one day, it's still a terrible shock for all of us and we're wondering how life can ever be the same without her. We all miss Aileen so much, for so many reasons. For some, it will be the time she got together and chatted. For some of you, that means you got together and listened while Aileen chatted. Some of you went for drives or op shopping with her. Some of you would have worked with her and many of you enjoyed the hospitality she provided. Today, Aileen would want us to celebrate her life and she would hope that afterwards we would remember her and tell the stories of when she was well and living the life she loved. During our service today, you'll hear about Aileen's life and what her life meant to us. For each of us has a story to tell and each of our stories are slightly different depending on the capacity in which you knew her. All those stories are special and Aileen loved you for helping her make so many wonderful memories throughout her life. I hope you will share some of your stories with the rest of Aileen's family and friends after the service. Because as Aileen's family and friends, you will probably understand what I mean when I say it's one of life's ironies, that even as we rejoice that Aileen is now free of pain and is enjoying eternal peace, we also long for her, healthy and well, with all her energy back in this life. Our longings leave us tired and aching inside from grief. But you need not feel that way. As we will hear shortly, Aileen packed an enormous amount of living into her life. And although Aileen has physically left us, she'll be walking beside us in our memories and in our hearts. The memories of Aileen you have as a relative or a friend will always be there. And there would be no sorrow in your hearts today if yesterday you had not known the pleasure of Aileen's presence in your life. And on that theme of celebration, I'd like to read a small verse in memory of Aileen. It's called Celebrate. Weep not for me, though I am gone, into the gentle night. Grieve if you will, but not for long, upon my soul's sweet flight. I am at peace, my soul's at rest. There is no need for tears. For with your love, I was so blessed for all those many years. There is no pain, I suffer not, the fear now all is gone. Put now these things out of your thoughts, for in your memory I live on. 
Remember not my fight for breath. Remember not the strife. Please do not dwell upon my death, but celebrate my life. The death of someone we care about creates a kaleidoscope of feelings. There is the pain at losing Aileen, but this reminds us of the depth of our love. There is courage, the courage to confront our sorrow, the courage to comfort each other. There is love. We hope that the light of her love will always shine on us. As we enter this day and share memories with of our memories of her with family and friends, we cherish the special place in our hearts that will always be reserved for Aileen. We thank her for the gift her living brought to each of us. We love her and we remember her. There is peace, the peace that Aileen has with no more pain, the peace that she has with no more struggles, the peace of knowing that she has lived a full and contented life. There are hopes and dreams, the hopes she had for her children, the dreams that she had for her grandchildren, particularly the dream that they will grow up to be successful in their own right, but more importantly, that they grow up to find the same love and happiness that Aileen has found with Keith. There are memories of the times we laughed, of the times we cried, of the times we dined, worked and travelled together, of the times we were angry with each other, of the silly things she did, of the caring joy she gave us. And I would now like Margot and Kristen to step forward and tell us more about some of those memories. You're coming, babe. Kristen and I have written our own little bit of memory, so we may repeat each other because it's been a busy week. So Aileen Isabel Hall was born in Echuca on the 3rd of August, 1937. The eldest of 10 children of Bert and Dory Hall. Mum always said she was the best and we think she was right. Bert, her dad, decided to buy 2,000 acres at Turumbury and he said, Aileen, you'd better go to live in Kyneton with my sister who ran the George Hotel. Mum's job was to make the beds. Sometimes later, Mum went to Surrey Hills to live with her grandmother, Christina Hall, Nee Nicholson. She got a job in the RACV Queen Street, Melbourne, where she worked as a clerk. Mum's sister Elma followed her to Melbourne and she also got a job in the RACV. Mum met Dad, Keith Ravity in the early 50s and they attended the 1956 Olympic Games. They were married on the 20th of April 1937, 57 sorry, in Box Hill. They introduced Elma to Dad's brother, Norman, and sub subsequently brothers married sisters. And they're sitting there. So Mum and Dad lived in Mooney Ponds where their three children were born, Stephen, 1960, Margot, 1962, and Ian, 1963. Dad was a qualified butcher and worked as a meat inspector, which meant we moved around a lot. Eventually we settled in Shepparton in the 1970s. Dad had always collected vintage cars and he attended the inaugural meeting of the Golden Valley Motor Vehicles Collectors Club, now the Drivers Club. Dad was the president six times and Mum worked tirelessly for the club. She'd wash all the cups after every meeting and I mean there was a lot of cups because I can even remember washing those cups. We never had a babysitter and we always went with mum and dad on memorable rallies enjoyed by the whole family. The three children would be left in the car, whatever the weather, for hours at a time and I recall sitting out the front of the Numerka High School while dad and mum were at the car club meeting with mum checking on us occasionally. One very memorable trip which I'm sure lots of you here, I know Ross was there and, and Rob, was to the nudist colony out of Echuca. Nine months later, our baby sister arrives. 
Kristen, born on Christmas Day, 1976. So I think we were there in January or February. And then Kristen arrived, Christmas Day, 1976. Mum now had Stephen, 16, in a wheelchair. I was 14 and Ian was 13 and a baby. Hence, I always looked after the baby and I, when my children were born, I was never scared to have kids. So Nathaniel just fitted in like Kristen. Mum had many jobs, including working at Fairleys, SPC cannery, which she loved, and milking cows. don't think she really enjoyed that, though. But anyway, one memorable holiday was to Norfolk Island with her sister, Alma, and I. And Mum was always proud to be a descendant of the first fleeters, Nathaniel Lucas and Olivia Gascoigne. She got her passport, even though she didn't need it. And she said she'd never fly on a plane, but she loved it. And we dressed up as convicts. We had a ball for 10 days. She loved it. Except she was a really good snorer, I must admit, yeah. <laughs> Christmas 2020 saw Mum and Dad go into respite together. Mum's health gradually declined and her dementia got worse. She loved to fiddle with jewellery and her hands were always black from the silver. Her favourite things to eat was the XXX mince and Smith potato <laughs> chips. Yeah, we've got XX mince with us. Uh, Mum settled into the home and Dad was visiting her three times a week. They would lay, lay on the bed watching television, holding hands. On Wednesday afternoon last week, Dad said, I'll see you tomorrow. Mum said, tomorrow. Sadly, Mum closed her eyes and never woke up. As per her wishes, she will be buried with her two sons by her side, which are somewhere just about there. Yeah, there they are over in the back, Stephen and Ian. She was an organised person so much that she probably bought this plot over 20 years ago and she wanted to be with her boys and that's where we're putting her today. So rest in peace, Mum. We love you, Margot. No, I got some. <laughs> um, so Mum loved us all so much. Her children, grandchildren and family were her life. She always wanted to know where we were and that we were safe. Um, she, I'm going to cry. <laughs> she was a generous woman um, who was more than any of us could fully comprehend or speak to. Um, Mum was not much of a cook. I think Margot must have done it. And every morning Mum would cook, but every morning she'd cook me bacon and eggs on toast for breakfast before school. She'd pack my lunch with a frozen ham sandwich and a frozen pea primer and an apple and a slice of cheese. Um, but, but mainly she just cooked meat and two veg. She'd put the meat, usually chops, in the fry pan on low before she started milking the cows. A um, couple of hours later she'd come in and turn them over maybe once during the milking. And then about 6.37 when she finished, um, they'd be ready. So they were very ready by then. And as I got older, she'd have me help by peeling the potatoes and getting the peas in the pot. But the chops still suffered the two or three hours. Um, when I had Sarah, Mum said, well, you're not staying home. You need to go to work. If you stay home, you don't get any super. <laughs> so off I went to work and Mum told me I should be a teacher. So I became a teacher. <laughs> <sighs> uh, Mum would walk down to our house after milking and she'd sit with Sarah. She'd sit until Sarah woke up and then look after her d all day. Mum taught Sarah to do puzzles, but they had to be the Ravensburger puzzles and they also had to be Disney. One day Mum could not find Sarah and she looked around the farm, eventually spotting her with Kelsey, her doll, walking along the back track back to our house. Mum would put Sarah in the pram and leave her at the gate at the cow shed. The cows would poke their heads out to say hello and Mum would shoo them away. Then she would feed the calves. Mum wheeled Sarah in the pram down to the calves and then go back to get the, and get the milk. She did it all. If I needed something, I asked Mum first. There was usually one in the house 
that she would have a spare of, but then she'd buy a few more just in case we needed another one one day. So, so far she bought a sewing machine in 1957 or 8. I've now found three of the same sewing machine and I expect to find more. So if anyone would love a nice green Husqvarna, I think we're going to have lots. One day I think we counted 54 egg cookers. <laughs> so we've got yep. them and crown corning was another thing she loved. <laughs> when I had Elliot, Mum drove into her house to look after him. She said he was too little to come out in the car until he got older. She was, mo she was most put out that she had to share Elliot with his other grandmother. <laughs> one day a week. One day a week. It did not impress her a bit, one bit. Mum would put, pick Elliot up at Guthrie Street School, getting there at 2.30 to get a park and staying until 4.00 when the traffic was not busy. And he would let, leave the sand pit. I think Elliot only went to kinder and school to play in the sand pit. We thought that was too much. Geez, you wrote enough. I know. And, and mum seemed to be struggling, so we moved Elliot to Kingupna to make it easier for her. That'll do. <laughs> mum still did the same thing there though. Even when she was at King Gutner, she still picked up Elliot too early and would leave too late. So then we got him to go to St Mel's. And little Chelsea, she picked she picked Chelsea up too and Chelsea's somewhere out there. I've seen her in the crowd. So So Mum no longer made her bed, it was always pristine. She did the hospital corners and everything. She no longer did the dishes. She could have eaten off the sink. The way she cleaned it, she no longer cooked any tea and when Dad asked her for a drink or something, she told him no. And they were both losing weight. Mum refused to bathe and we moved Mum into care where we, we believed she lived longer than she would have at home. She, we know she would have hated it, but she didn't really know where home was and she passed away and we will always miss her. Yep. Love you, Mum. Love you, Mum. I'm sorry Sarah wrote something too. Oh. <laughs> <He> says, <laughs> So Sarah, she's watching from Florida in Disneyland. Yep. She's in Disney World actually. So Sarah's in Disney World and we can wave. So she'll be watching. So she said, when I was younger, Mama was like a second mum to me. While my mum was at work, Mama looked after me. We would watch TV, play with my Snoopies, build jigsaw puzzles, play on the trampoline or in the kiddie pool she would set up on the veranda. Another pastime we both loved was going to the op shops. However, I think this is where her collecting started. <laughs> As I got older, she would pick me up from daycare or school. She spoiled me. I think that had helped that I was the only granddaughter but always brought me everything I wanted. Whenever I would stay over at Mama and P's, that's what they call Dad P. She would always make me homemade crumb chicken tenders for dinner. And if I got scared throughout the night, she'd come and sleep in my bed instead of with P. Sorry, P. Um, she was the most loving and caring woman and the best mama to all of us grandkids. I'm very saddened that I am unable to attend today, but I know that mama would want me to keep living my dream at Disney World. Although her memories began to fade over the last 10 years, our memories of her never will. I will cherish the memories I made with her forever and continue to do the activities that we loved in her honour, such as jigsaw puzzles. My days with Mama were my favourite. I miss you, Mama. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margot and Kristen. I talked about as much as any a mother and a wife, and this next verse talks about more about a mother, but it's apl applicable to other things. It's called for one who gives so much to others. It's not the things that can be bought that are life's richest treasure. It's just the little heart gifts that money cannot measure. A cheerful smile, a friendly word, a sympathetic nod are the priceless little treasures from the storehouse of our God. They are the things that can't be bought with silver or with gold, for thoughtfulness and kindness and love are never sold. They are the priceless things in life for which no one can pay, 
and the giver finds rich recompense in giving them away. And who on earth gives more away and does more good for others than understanding kind and wise and selfless loving mothers who ask no more than just the joy of helping those they love to find in life the happiness that they are dreaming of. Now today we must remember that we're not here because Aileen has died. We're here because she has lived and during her time on earth she shared her life with us and although her life has ended it has been filled with love, laughter and happiness. I now, now ask you to join with me as we pray for Aileen in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So, dear Lord, today we lift up our hearts in gratitude for the life of Aileen, for all the kindness she displayed during her life, for all that she was to those who loved her, and for everything in her life that reflected goodness and love. Help us to be confident, to release her to you, to accept her death in the same way we accepted her life. May we rejoice in Aileen's life, be thankful that her life touched on ours. Surround us and all that mourn today with your continuing compassion. Do not let grief be without end or overwhelm us, but draw us closer together in faith and love. Amen. And today we want to be thinking not only of the darkness of death, but the splendour of life. So help us even now to face life with courage and hope. Give us the grace and strength to go on knowing that the best tribute we can pay Aileen is to let her life be a continuing inspiration to us. So Aileen, you'll be forever in the memories of all who knew and loved you. And it is with this final goodbye to you that all of us here say, we will remember you until we meet again. So tenderly and reverently, we commit our beloved Eileen to the elements, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And now some final words before we finish. As we look back over time, and thinking of Aileen, we find ourselves wondering, did we remember to thank you enough for all you've done for us? For all the times you were by our sides to help and support us, to celebrate our successes, to understand our problems and accept our defeats, or for teaching us by your example the value of hard work, good judgment, courage and integrity. We wonder if we thanked you for the sacrifices you made to let us have the very best and for the simple things like laughter, smiles, hugs and things we shared. If we've forgotten to show our gratitude enough for all the things you did, we're thanking you now and hope you knew all along how much we loved you and how much you meant to us. So shortly we will finish the service for Aileen with a short verse, but before I get there, I would like to remind you that the purpose of our gathering here today is not to listen to me talking about Aileen. Now the purpose of gathering here today is for each of you here to remember the Aileen that you knew and to share those stories with each other and I would encourage you to do just that. Our concluding verse is about the memories that remain with us when someone we care about is no longer with us. It's called Afterglow. I'd like the memory of me to be a happy one. I'd like to leave an afterglow of smiles when day is done. I'd like to leave an echo whispering softly down the ways of happy times and laughing times and bright and sunny days. 
I'd like the tears of those who grieve to dry before the sun, of happy memories that I leave behind when my days are done. Now, just before I step down, uh, I would like to thank you once again for your attendance here today, for the comfort and condolences you've expressed to each other. And I would warmly like to invite you all to the Echuca Hotel, the address is on the booklet, to share refreshments and your own memories of Aileen with each other. We've got some flowers to place in the grave as a final tribute as we listen to some music, so thank you. We'll meet again, my friend, somewhere down the line. Who knows where or when, another place, another time. We'll share a few old songs and memories on my mind. Yes, I know we'll meet again, my friend, somewhere down the line. We'll meet again, my friend, somewhere down the line. Thank you. 